Breakthrough Parenting, Moving Your Family from Struggle to Cooperation. Lesson 2.3, Making the Shift. Controlling Children. Controlling Children. Do you want to be controlled by another person? Do you enjoy it when others tell you how to think, feel, and behave? Most of us feel better when we are in charge of making important decisions about our own lives. We want to be self-determined and will resist being forced to do things that are against our will. People don't resist change, they resist being changed. Once again, remember this quote, people don't resist change, they resist being changed. Think about it. While most parents would not like to be controlled themselves, they think that it is important to control their children. The authoritarian approach to raising children maintains that parents need to control their children. Control implies force and can be a way of not respecting another's boundaries. A person whose boundaries and will have not been respected is likely to feel defensive, frustrated, and angry. He or she is likely to respond to the situation with a power struggle. External control of others is the old way of being in relationships. Today, there is a better way. A better way to describe a parent's role is that of a steward who keeps his or her children safe and growing in healthy ways. The steward's goal is for the children to live fulfilling lives and to make positive contributions to society as adults. While children do not want to be controlled against their will, they do want others to care about them and to look out for their best interest. The fact is that adults also want others to look out for their best interest when they are unable to do so. When I was seven years old, I was getting off of a bus with my father. It was cold out that night and it was beginning to get dark. As my father and I stood at the curb waiting for the bus to drive away, there was a long pause. The bus was not moving. I interpreted the pause to mean that the bus driver was waiting for us to cross the street. Just as I stepped off of the curb in front of the bus and started to walk across the street, I was jerked back onto the curb. My father had grabbed my jacket collar and pulled me back out of the street. I had misinterpreted what the bus driver was doing, as at that instant the bus had begun to move. I am so grateful to my father for looking out for my safety and for using control when he needed to. Don't we all want others to look out for us when we are heading down a perilous path? Ideally, children ought to respond to being influenced, but in reality, this isn't always the case. So what can a parent do when a child is too young to understand what is dangerous, or too emotional to listen, or too determined to be irresponsible? Influence is not likely to work in these situations. At least not at the moment. Parents have a duty to protect their children from harm. The parents must make a judgment call about what action to take. My father didn't take the time to influence me. He reacted. Some parents have to assume control over their children because it would be irresponsible not to. However, control should be used for a higher purpose, not as an end in itself. One test of whether assuming control is a good idea is to think of what the children would do in the situation if he or she were mature enough to make a sound decision for himself or herself. After the fact and the incident with my father, I was happy that he protected me. Wouldn't you like to teach your children self-discipline, where they do what is good for them without threats of punishment? This can be a great stress saver for both you and your children, but can only be accomplished by helping them develop their own internal control. Children need to be self-determined eventually. They need to learn how to be captains of their own ships. It is therefore better and longer lasting to influence them to make good choices on their own based on solid information and healthy values. Here is the way that Adam's father influenced him to make a good decision. Adam, four, and his father are at a toy store to pick out a present to take to his friend Robert's ninth birthday party. Adam is not interested in this activity for Robert's sake. He's just a kid in a toy store. He is distracted by a toy that he wants. When his father brings his attention back to the task, he begins to cry loudly, 
which is very distracting to everyone else in the store. Dad takes Adam outside to a bench and allows him to compose himself. After five minutes, once Adam has calmed down, his father says, when you turned four last month, we had a party for you. Lots of people brought you presents. Do you remember that Robert brought you those books you like so much? The ones I've been reading to you every night before bed. Adam nods. Dad continues. Well, now it's Robert's turn to receive a present. His party is this afternoon. I don't think it would feel good for you to go to his party without a present. I'd like to know what you think we ought to do about this. Adam answers. It's okay if we get a present for Robert, if I can have that game too. Dad responds. It can be hard to buy a gift for someone else without getting anything for yourself. But we didn't come here to buy a game for you. If you really want that game, then we'll talk about it some more and maybe buy it. But we won't be doing that today. What I would like to know is what Robert would like for a present. Can you think of something? Adam gives this some thought. He likes to put together model airplanes. Dad gets excited. Hey, that's a good idea. They have some great ones here. I bet we can find one that he doesn't already have. That afternoon, Adam was very proud when Robert opened his present and yelled, This is exactly the model I wanted. Thank you, Adam. Adam's father uses influence instead of force or control. He explains to Adam the purpose of their trip. He is careful not to make Adam wrong because Adam wants something for himself more than he wants a present for Robert. He does also not say no to the game that Adam wants. Rather, he simply says that it will not happen today and refocuses Adam on solving the problem at hand. Right away, Adam begins participating in solving the problem with good results. In fact, Robert really likes his present a lot and Adam feels good about himself knowing that he had helped choose it. The goal is for parents to replace control with influence. And the author's purpose in writing this book is to influence you to make a shift from fear-based thinking methods to more loving ones. She hopes that what you will take from these pages are the concepts, the insights, and skills that you believe will be the best value to you and your children. And anything here that you disagree with, you are allowed to disagree. She's not forcing you to do so. But of course, she is attempting to influence you. Unconditional love and the true self. We come into the world with a true self. A false self is then created when we attempt to please others by denying what is true for us. The fear of losing another's love and approval can be so strong that we can lose track of our true selves. The goal is for both parents and children to use the environment of the family to support all family members continuing unfolding into their true selves. This is best done with the expression of unconditional love. You do not want your children to lose track of who they really are. Conditional love is, I'll love you if you please me. Unconditional love is, I'll love you always, no matter what. We must separate our feelings about our child's behavior from the way we feel about the child. We can dislike the behavior of our child intensely, but still unconditionally love him or her as a person. This can be difficult because most of us were brought up under another system. One common way of correcting children was to shame them. The subsequent feelings of guilt would then bring children into submission. Contrast that outdated method with how one father expresses his unconditional love to his son. Mikey, I want you to know that I love you. I always have loved you and I always will love you. There is nothing that you can do that will change how I feel about you. However, this doesn't mean that I can't get upset at the things you do. I might even get really mad, but it is important for you to see and understand that who you are is different from what you do. The things that you do will never change the fact that I will always love you. You can count on that. This message bears repeating over and over as no one ever gets tired of hearing that he or she is loved. Trust is developed when your children are not afraid of losing your love, when they know that they are loved unconditionally. 
They do not ever have to be afraid to tell you about their feelings and experiences. They can make mistakes and feel perfectly safe about sharing them with you because the continued flow of your love for them is not in jeopardy. When this level of trust exists between you and your children, you become a powerful role model. In this climate, you will see power struggles and stress greatly reduced. Think of a person for whom you have the greatest respect. Some people might pick a relative who showed a special kindness towards them, or a famous person like Mother Teresa or Winston Churchill, or an inspirational person in their community who affected their life in a positive way. Imagine that this person was unable to fully take care of himself or herself, and you found that you had been entrusted with his or her daily care. Most people would truly extend themselves to treat someone whom they greatly respect in the most loving, nurturing way, even if that meant making special accommodations. Why then is it acceptable to treat our children with any less respect and honor? Our children deserve the best possible care. We are the only parents they have, and they are depending upon us to be responsible to be stewards on their behalf. End of lesson 2.3, almost finished.